Welcome back. And it's yeah. afternoon, nine months uh, past the hour of 12. And yes, now we're moving on to speak about the legal implications, or if there are any legal, legal implications regarding the proposal. Or oh, last week, our president mentioned vaccines could become mandatory because initially when the announcement was made that South Africa is going to be receive, uh, I mean, receive a vaccine rollout. And that the president, I think he stated and then reiterated that these will be on a voluntary basis and uh, allayed everybody's fears for those, for whatever reason, were still deciding to want to make an uh, informed decision whether they would like to be vaccinated or not. However, last week's message was, uh, there was an inference or implication that vaccines would become mandatory. So that is why I've got a labor, law, a labor lawyer and labor expert, uh, Michael Bagram, joining us to just find out what are the legal implications regarding the vaccine now becoming mandatory and what rights do we have in terms of the legal framework for mandatory vaccine. So let's speak and let's get some uh, legal opinion regarding mandatory vaccinations becoming mandatory. Uh, good afternoon, Michael, and welcome to uh, Mid Morning Tokyo on Salah Media. Thank you. Thank you. I feel very honored to be present and I really appreciate it. And Mariam, you're right. It is an issue and it's become a big, hotly debated issue, not just in South Africa, but around the world. Um, you will recall right in the beginning of the pandemic, well, not immediately in the beginning, but right near the beginning of the pandemic, um, President Ramaphosa did say to the nation on one of the family chats um, that it will not become compulsory and no one has to have any fears about it becoming compulsory. And as soon as we get the vaccination in South Africa, it will be a, a vaccination that you can choose to take or not to take. Um, and, and that's probably correct in terms of our constitution. Uh, we have a right to uh, deny ourselves medication. We have a right uh, of bodily integrity in South Africa. We've got one of the best constitutions in the world. Um, I'm a bit biased, but I would say the best constitution in the world. I've had a look at many constitutions from different countries. Some don't even have a constitution. And we do have bodily integrity. But I think the president has been misunderstood. Now, I'm not here to defend the president at all. Um, I'm here merely to tell you about um, the uh, law behind the uh, vaccination and how it affects all of us. You and I, uh, we both work. And how does it affect us? Well, there is a big difference between mandatory uh, vaccination and compulsory vaccination, an enormous difference. And you would have noticed that last week, uh, the President Ramaphosa came on and he spoke about a mandatory vaccination, not a compulsory one, but a mandatory vaccination. It still is the individual's choice as to whether you want to have the vaccination or not. Um, I must come clean and tell you that I personally have had the vaccination. I, I think it's better for me and I think it would be better for the people I'm working for. But that's a personal decision, and that's a decision I made. However, the problem that we're facing now in South Africa and why the debate is becoming so hot is that what happens if your employer says to you that we want to consult with you, we want to consult with the staff, we want to introduce a policy at the workplace, and I'm a labor lawyer, and I've been doing that for the last three weeks now, I've been compulsory um, vaccination as opposed to mandatory vaccination. And in fact, I've been negotiating with trade unions and groups of staff um, about policies that are going to be introduced at their workplace. Uh, I've been representing many employers as an attorney, a labor lawyer, and we're having this debate. And of course, many of the employees are saying that the president promised us that it would not become compulsory. And I'm telling you it's not compulsory. And I'll tell you why. If you wish to have bodily integrity in terms of the constitution, that's your right. And you can tell your employer that you're not going to have the vaccination. However, the employer's also got rights. And this is where the debate becomes hot. 
The employer will say, after consulting with Michael, after consulting with the group, and after having a look at my operational requirements of my business, I'm going to need you, Michael, to come and sit at work, interact with the public, consult with the public, and to interact with the rest of the staff. And I'm telling you that I can't use you virtually. I need you to come in. And I'm now telling you that unless you have a very good alternative, you must get a vaccination if you want to come into my work. Now, that's mandatory. That's not compulsory because I've still got the choice then to say, well, sorry, I'm not going to have the vaccination. The employer will then say, well, then I have the right because of my operational requirements and because I've been through the consultation process to retrench you, dismiss you for operational requirements or even dismiss you outright. I have a choice as the employer to trump your individual right. In other words, I have certain rights as an employer in terms of the public health and safety legislation, the public health and safety regulations, and of course the rights of the group. Let me give you an example. For instance, I have been consulting with a small cut, make and trim, a CMT operation in Cape Town. They've got 14 people employed. All 14 were asked by the employer to have the vaccination because they work in close circumstances. They work together in a close circumstance. It's not the greatest spot. And they all then said, all right, we'll have the vaccination. The employer then arranged to take everyone for the vaccination, arranged the day off, and also um, then offered to take them afterwards off for lunch, which they all did. It then became clear that two decided that at the, at the venue, for whatever reason, that they weren't going to have the vaccination. They didn't tell the employer. They didn't have the vaccination. They came with them to the venue. They went with them afterwards for lunch. And the employer then heard from the other employees that two of them decided, no, they're not going to have the vaccination. And the problem then became a real issue for two reasons. One, because the rest of the group said, this is not right. We don't want to work with those two anymore because they're now exposing us to uh, spreading of the virus and we don't want to work with them. And the other issue, of course, is that they were being duplicitous. They didn't tell the employer, but they went for the, for the day. They took the day off. They had lunch, etc. So the employer then came to me and I said, that's obviously wrong what they've done. You've consulted properly with them. They didn't come forward and say they've got health issues so they can't, they can't have the vaccination or they've got religious issues. Um, you know, if your, if your religious leader said that you can't have the vaccination, then there might be something that the employer has to take into account. But they didn't say that. They didn't come up with any of those reasons. And in fact, they've both been dismissed. They haven't been retrenched. So that's a big issue. Another example is a lady who is an international buyer for a large group uh, decided that she wasn't going to have the vaccination. The group consulted everyone. Some people don't have to have it because they can accommodate them to stay at home and they can do their work at home. And others don't have to have it because they can be accommodated at work but won't be interacting with anyone. So they've accommodated some people and said, if you don't want to have it, that's fine. We can accommodate you. But this lady has to travel. She's a purchaser of uh, fashion goods and she has to travel. And she can't travel unless she has the vaccination. So they've said to her, listen, you've got to have it because otherwise you can't fulfill your task as a buyer. She said no. She'd rather do it over Zoom and Microsoft and whatever platform she wants to use. And they said no. We employed you specifically to go to the shows, interact with people, negotiate prices, negotiate fashion. You can't do it. We're going to dismiss, which they've done. That's going to be challenged. We'll see court cases in the future. It'll be a very interesting debate. Yeah. What uh, Michael, sorry yes. to interject. No, what I no, need no. to, because I'm hearing some concerns is with regard to side effects. So a few individuals are afraid. So if, because, I mean, the, who, who takes responsibility if your employee makes it mandatory for you to take your uh, vaccine and thereafter uh, employees start having a, a side effect in it? Who's then liable for those medical cost treatments? 
do they get booked off sick leave or does this come out so what are the implication then the response i'm i'm speaking now the burden of responsibility once somebody takes a vaccine and then they start experiencing side effects and i mean for those that are once you vaccinated some do experience up to two weeks flu like symptoms they after you have many reports of you know back aches and what 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 i'm saying is then uh, who's going to bear the cost here okay thank you yes that is a that is a concern a very big concern um i in fact have been consulting with some employees who did have side effects no one as long as two weeks but i know two or three people felt uh, ill for two or three days if they have ongoing problems first of all if the employer has insisted and made it mandatory and then they've taken it and they get sick they are covered by insurance from the compensation fund the department of employment and labor have put up a special fund for people who have got side effects or symptoms or problems subsequent to the vaccination obviously it's got to be a we've got to be shown that it's because of the vaccination and it's got to be appropriate in other words you can't say now i've got arthritis um and so therefore it's i'm blaming the vaccination it has to be yes can you hear me can you hear me i um i think maybe you've gone um i'm still live and i'm busy explaining that the department of employment and labor um have got a fund through the compensation fund to protect you so there's no problem with that at all um the the reality is that if anyone has any results because of the compensation fund um not being able to protect you uh that you can go to the CCMA the commission for conciliation mediation and arbitration so there's no problem can you still hear me or or not anymore sorry uh mrs mia um can you i think you have gone blank on your side um and i'm going to carry on speaking because i think the audience our listeners can still hear uh, what what has transpired and so there have been some claims against the compensation fund not that many because we haven't seen many uh, people uh, coming out of the vaccination process and having the the complaints thereafter but if they are there it's not going to affect your sick leave it's not going to affect your salary the employer in fact at the end of the day uh will be able to cover you through the compensation fund. Uh, Mrs. Mia, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Ah, sorry. Yes, I can. I think, uh, loud and clear. Uh, sorry about that. I think maybe we had a bit of a blank spot, but not a problem. So, so the reality is to answer you and to placate everyone that has fears that they might get some sort of problems after having taken the vaccination. because the employer has told them it's mandatory those fears are not well founded because our department of employment labor through the compensation fund will cover you entirely um and in fact anything up to 3 months um they will cover you uh, the employer has to pay your salary and the employer can then claim it back from the compensation fund and it won't affect your sick leave because the compensation fund again um has put up the fund through the minister of employment and labor tulas and kezi has ensured the public assured the public that the money is there and that everyone will be protected it will be interesting to see what comes out of nedlac which is the debating chamber set up by government nedlac are busy debating it right now um as to how much money they're going to have in the compensation fund to protect everyone and whether they can as government make it mandatory and um, yes because i think that information is not uh, gone out in terms of um if there are any side effects uh, what would be the process the implication how you you you'll be covered and also uh, em- employers reassuring the employees that if something does happen and that you will still receive your your salary and then we will then 
uh, intervene in terms of facilitate their compensation via the compensation fund because uh, you know this message needs to go out as well. Yeah, no, you you're right. I think the government has failed us in the sense that they're not actually importing information. But I can assure everyone because I have spoken to the minister myself and I've sat in the Portfolio Committee of Employment and Labour and there is the fund, it is there, there have been claims and every single employee is protected if there are mandatory vaccination fallout. So there's no, and even, even and I'm, I'm sad to say, but I mean, we haven't seen it yet, but what happens if someone dies? The family will then be protected if it's through the vaccination and a mandatory vaccination. We haven't had a death from the mandatory vaccination at all. And we've had very, very few claims of people who have been ill thereafter. There will be some employers that aren't registered with a compensation fund. The employee must still uh, report it because they have to. Every single employee in South Africa has to be um, with the compensation fund. You can't, you can't not have an employee... So there are some naughty Absolutely. Michael, uh, as somebody who assists with HR in the business, I can tell you, trying to register, trying to get hold of them, especially through COVID times and people are working remotely, is has its own challenges. It's, it's far from a seamless process. And I think, uh, to be fair to employers, it's not that uh, they don't want to register new employees or that on the system and that it's just the bureau tech nightmare trying to get things sorted out and to speak to somebody or get your email answered in terms of process is really, really difficult. I respect that entirely. And I tell you, you are voicing what every single HR practitioner in the country is saying. The department is broken. The department is, unfortunately, I mean, I've got to say it on air, they're useless, but... Um, and I don't want the minister to come and beat me up, but they are really, really bad. Um, and, I'm, and I've told him to his face, I don't have a problem with that. But still, because the system is broken, doesn't mean that you mustn't try and get registered and also doesn't mean that you have protection. You have. Every single employee has got a right. That right is protection. And every single employee has insurance through the compensation fund. And if you're not in, not, even if you're not registered at that point, the employer has to keep trying and has to show proof that they've tried. So if Michael Bagram has started new, you want to first of all register Michael Bagram for the Unemployment Insurance Fund. You want to register Michael for the Compensation Fund and for PAYE. That's your duty as an employer. I understand that PAYE works like a charm. The receiver Absolutely. is fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely, Michael. When they collect, everything works there. It functionally, you get your return, you put it there. It works like a charm, but when it's time to give back, it's another yeah. ballgame. No, I know, but it still doesn't affect the employee. It affects the employer mm -hmm. because the employer has to pay the salary for three months while the employee is recovering. The employer afterwards starts crying because they don't get paid for years. Mm -hmm. and I understand that, uh, but we can't we can't scare employees off from having the vaccination because the employer is suffering. Um, uh, you know, I understand that. I, I I'm a lawyer acting for employers all the time, and they're always shouting at me and saying the department never gets back to me, the department never pays, the department doesn't acknowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that doesn't mean that the employees must be scared off and saying that there could be problems. They, we, mustn't, we, mustn't have, we mustn't do that to them. Uh, the, the reality is modern science is telling us that the vaccination is working. Whether that modern science is correct or not, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. And all I'm saying is government has to put in place insurance for employees that might get affected by that vaccination. They might. I don't know. I wasn't affected. I'm very lucky. I've got all the comorbidities. I was scared. I've got diabetes. I was very scared uh, to come back to work. But I had the vaccination. I'm back at work, and I'm hoping it works. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, uh, knowledge is power, and we need to empower everybody in, in terms of 
their their rights, their obligations, their responsibilities. And uh, for me, I, I don't think education has been enough uh, in terms of allaying fears, in terms of telling employees this this is what's going to happen if you experience anything negative or whatever your fears are. This the this is how we're going to progress afterwards if you show something these are steps this is what you can support you can tap into in things like this and for me that that is important because it's one thing you have this consultative processes in terms of explaining to the employees why you need to get vaccinated but i don't think enough is done to allay fears now i absolutely agree with you but you know as i said the department um, has all the faults in the world and the department is not playing the game but then we must also put some duty on the empl- on the employers to, to allay these fears and also trade unions i think the trade unions haven't been that fair although uh, to take um, a feather out of the cap kasatu has come out with statements now recently in the last week they have come out with statements trying to allay so at least kasatu is now trying but they've been silent for the last 6 months about the vaccination and whether it should be mandatory or not they've now come down on the side all the trade unions have come down on the side of mandatory vaccination uh, but obviously after consultation and they've also t- trying to explain kasatu that is the umbrella body is trying to explain to their organizers in the various trade unions um that there is protection so at least kasatu is now woken up Uh, I don't know about Saftu. I, I, I haven't heard from Mr. Vavi at all, but it's not just government. We must also put some blame on employers, and we must put some blame on trade unions for not going out and educating people. And then we've got a program like this on Salam Media, which people are listening to, and they can hear that there is protection. So this is this is a step towards education. and we have to then applaud salam media for doing their bit for public health um and to explain to people that there is that insurance and everyone is entitled to claim from that insurance if you were subject to a mandatory vaccination at work and you got sick because of the vaccination you have got a claim and also every single employee needs to know that the employer has to pay your first three months um of that sickness it doesn't come off your sick leave and if you've got anything on a permanent basis you can claim from the compensation fund or if you've got some ill health that came out from it because of the compulsory i mean the mandatory vaccination then you have got a claim against the compensation fund and that you hear in today on salam media i'm hoping that other media houses do the same and that they do their art and educate the listeners of their rights Uh, because look we've got some great labor laws in this country let's at least use them and let's get people in the know let people know what it's all about and i think a program like this is valuable thank you ma michael and thank you for empowering our listeners and educating our listeners uh, we have uh, listeners who are both employers and employees here so you know for me knowledge is power and yes with enough knowledge we can make informed decisions and responsible choices so thank you for your input in this and we wish you well good afternoon mike good afternoon and thank you once again for having me on air i really appreciate it you're doing good work keep well thank you peace and blessings that was label lawyer and expert michael bagram and we were speaking about the legal implications of mandatory vaccines and yes what we cost us employees had if they are af- well they have to take our to the use well it's a strong word but forced to then vaccinate because it becomes mandatory and you are fearful in terms of possible side effects will you be compensated according to michael employee has your employee has to pay you after 3 months and then if it proves to be a permanent you can then claim from compensation fund but you know what the theory and reality there's a big uh, gray area between theory and reality and it's always not as it seems but let's watch the space and see if the government is going to make it easy and seamless 
as it is in theory. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we want to acknowledge a young South African who has developed a maths program based on his experience to help other South African school-going children in terms of uh, removing uh, mathematics anxiety and, yes, the stress of mathematics and the fear of mathematics. All this on Educational Insight segment after the break. <laughs> 